Welcome to the As Yet Untitled Podcast. With your hosts, Tony and Sean. Hello. Hi. This is the As Yet Untitled Podcast. Yep. In case you didn't know from the, the uh, theme song that just played. <laughs> yeah, just, just in case. If you didn't check out the last episode, uh, it was about uh, the people and drummers and musicians that inspired me and continue to inspire me to become a drummer. And this one's kind of a, a continuation from that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's your version. So Tony's going to be doing most of the talking this time. Yeah. I don't talk that often on here because I never really have much to say. Well, you do basically half of the talking. Basically. But <laughs> I often don't have much to say, so I thought, yeah, sure. Now I'll, it's just I'll talk. <laughs> I'll, I'll do a whole episode. Why not? <laughs> so before we get started... If you haven't followed us, follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and all of the podcast places. And also make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel to watch it, listen to it there. Um, and our social medias at the As Yet Untitled podcast. We have a Facebook and an Instagram um, and you'll be able to find out all kinds of news and information and stuff and you won't miss any any episodes. And you can yeah. get involved in the conversation, which is what this is all about. We want that interaction, yeah. public interaction. Let us know. Yeah, let us know if you think we suck or <laughs> if you think we're good or if you have ideas for uh, future episodes or... A contrasting opinion to yeah. anything we say. Yeah, or you agree. Yeah. That's nice. It's nice to see that other people agree. So yeah, let's uh, let's jump straight in now that we've gone done that little bit of housekeeping. Housekeeping? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's housekeeping. The house that is the internet. The podcast <laughs> housekeep. So... Yeah, I'm a photographer. Um, well, <laughs> I'm trying to be a photographer. Um, I have a pers- personal photography account. I have a photography account on Instagram called photos by underscore Tony. Go you can follow s- it. Yeah, go follow that. Um, and that's where you can see my work. I want to be a music photographer, but I also am exploring more personal projects and ones that have less of a specific agenda, Mm. I guess. I guess mainly because, you know, COVID has stopped music photography from existing for the most part. Yeah, but also it's quite a common practice in photography to turn the camera on yourself and learn more about yourself through your practice because it's art. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So yeah, we're talking in a similar style to what we had in Sean's episode, I'm going to be talking about the people that have inspired me um, throughout my life and how I've got to where I am today. I'm kind of of taking a chronological order, but for the most part, it's just looking at a couple of specific people who have inspired me and why they have specifically done it. I don't have a massive list of... (laughs) So, like Sean had, with a massive list of musicians right at the end, because I work in a very different way when it comes to my inspiration. I am very much inspired by my surroundings and the immediate things I'm interacting with. Hmm. So, yeah, I get I get a lot more inspiration from the people I'm around and the work that I have more of a chance of seeing. M- music is a little bit a little bit different. Yeah, because yeah. you can interact with music a lot more every day, whereas like with a lot of like say the bigger names in photography, their work is wherever they're putting it, and it's and harder to find it. There's and... so much more photography everywhere, and there's so much more visual things to be inspired by yeah. than there is music. So yeah, I get I get that. There's it's a case of you could see something that looks pretty and be like I'm inspired. I want to take a photo of that in a certain way. That is, yeah, it's different. Yeah, it's very different. So I've had that's why I've taken a bit of a different approach to this. Mm. Yeah, starting from where it all began. Where it all began at birth, where you were handed a camera (laughs) and designated your job. Yes. (laughs) My God, if if life worked like that, I'd be so happy. Like in Futurama. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be brilliant. You just get like. Or actually, it wouldn't. It'd be horrifying. But (laughs) anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Continue. So yeah, where it all began was my mother. My mum is a very creative person. Um, It was only when I actually left home that my mum started to work. (laughs) Like, she got her first job. Well, I say her first job. The first job I've known her to have. Um, Because, well, she was always looking after us. She was always trying to keep us the best that 
the best people we could be. And that's something my mum's always been very aware of. She wanted us to be more emotionally available. Sure. Like she she tried to encourage us to be just whoever we wanted to be. And that's something I really I, I love that about my mum. Shout out to my mum. <laughs> um, <laughs> so she always encouraged us to follow our dreams. So whatever I would tell her I wanted to be, she would just be like, Yeah, if you, if that's what you wanna do, do it. Like, that is just my mum's approach to things. She never would be like, what about this problem that you would have with it? What about this? How would you live? She'd just be like, if that's what you want to do, go and make it work. Like, my mum didn't know how to make it work. So you went into the arts. Yes. Where money is never made. <laughs> so she would just be like that. She'd be like, if, you're, if, you, if that's what you want to do to make it to make your life happy, do it. Hmm. She, she didn't have enough knowledge to tell us, like, yeah, how to do this. But she would have the emotional support that we can do whatever we want. And mum was also a really creative person. So she would sit with us and draw and paint. If we was like, oh, I want to, I saw this thing on Art Attack. Can we try it? She'd be like, yeah, sure. <laughs> let's, let's give it a go. Yeah. And we'd sit at the, at the dining room table and do arts together. And I just, or I'd sit there and be like, I feel like drawing, but I don't know what to draw. So I'd literally get my mum to list things out to me to draw. <laughs> and I would like, make a grid on a piece of paper and just draw these tiny little things because I, I just didn't know what to draw. So that's something that was really nice. Like, my mum was always very supportive of that. Yeah. And then there's also just, like, a physical supporting thing that my mum would do. As I started to do photography in college, I'm not the greatest at compiling sketchbooks. I hate printing things. I hate cutting things. I hate sticking things. You're also not the most academically minded. No. So for things like college, it's it gets pretty <laughs> stressful. But even things like, I don't like cutting paper. Like, I don't like handling paper. <laughs> it's just, a, it's a very sp very particular thing about me. But my mum would literally sit there and cut out, like, loads of pictures for me. Like, I would print out pictures and she would just cut them out for me, ready for me to stick them into my book. Like, she would just sit there for an hour, just watching TV, cutting these out. You're a cheater. Out. You're a cheater, Tony. You didn't even do your own work. <laughs> You know, all of it for you. I didn't even cut out my own my own pictures. Exactly. <laughs> but my mum would help out with things like that, and I'd just like come back out like a, a couple of days later with another wad of paper and be like, "Mom, please," and she'd do it for me because my mum's a real G. You're a terrible child. <laughs> <laughs> Says you. Torturing your poor mum. <laughs> um. Anyway. <laughs> um. My family's also always been, like, really supportive. Like, my siblings, I'm the youngest of four. So I guess that's like, that entitles me to my creative child. <laughs> I'm allowed to be the creative one because I have the other three that have, can go do whatever they're doing to become, like, you know... Real human beings? <laughs> yeah, real humans. I can be the arts child. So, but they, they were really en encouraging for anything I want to do. Like, my sister, she's... She's inspired me because she's always, any goal that she's had, she's gone for it. So she moved country because she wanted to. Like, hell yeah. Um, but one thing is, like, my brother Stephen, shout out to Stephen. Um, he encouraged me to get into photography. Because when I started doing photography at, I, I guess, A-level, it's technically a B-tech, but is it the same? E at college. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same, like, level of qualification. When I started it, I got told I needed a camera, like a DSLR. And I was like, I don't know how I'm going to get that. I am broke. So Stephen bought me one. Like, it was a second-hand one. Bought it from CEX. Yeah. But he bought it for me because he wanted to support me. And he was just like, yeah. So was that your first camera? Yeah, that was at my college. first. That was my first camera at college. Okay. Um, my Nikon D3200. <laughs> okay. Um... Yeah, that one was a nice little camera. I had my just normal like kit lens, but it had the ability to do everything I wanted it to do. Mm. And yeah, it was where I learned to do everything. And it took me all the way into uni. I had it until halfway through uni. Yeah. Wow. Um, I only re yeah I replaced it in my second year. And you've instantly replaced it again <laughs> in the third year. <laughs> yeah, and then in my second year, uh, with my second camera, I was like, this one just isn't working with me. I d I don't know. I just wasn't gelling well with it. So. I recently upgraded. But yeah. Stephen got me my first camera. I love it. Um, and then there's also Terence. Shout out to Terence. 
Um, Your other brother. Yeah, my other brother. <laughs> he um he also did photography at college. He was doing it pretty much at the same time I was because he started, he went back to college to get a photography qualification. Mm. And he's only slightly older than you. Yeah, well, it, I guess it, it wasn't really like a college course. It was like the higher qualification. So there's like that middle ground between college and uni. Like those like HN- It was like a higher level college it's qualification. Like HNC kind of thing. I don't, I, know. I don't know. It's a Scottish thing, right? I think it's a, it might not just be a Scottish thing, but he did it in Scotland. Okay. He was doing photography as well, but he was able to do more of like a technical course where they taught him more about what <laughs> how to do photography rather than how to Rather than the the artsy <laughs> bullshit side of it that your uni's trying to teach yeah, you. Yeah, so my my course is a fine arts photography course. That's the problem with mine. So, like, they're teaching us how to do artsy side of things and encouraging us to think about it in a different way, whereas Terry's course taught him... How to how, actually be a photographer. How, how to be a photographer. <laughs> so he actually helped me a lot because he was sharing knowledge with me that not many people would think to share. Mm. Like, Terry was the first person who told me what shooting in RAW was. Mm. That's ridiculous. I had been doing photography for years at this point. Yeah. And then he was like, why aren't you shooting on RAW? And I was like, what the hell is RAW? <laughs> what do you mean? For those that don't know, RAW is a file type that holds a lot more information about the photo and it can be manipulated in a lot easier way because it There's has... so much more data. Yeah, it has more data in the file. Mm. So that was one thing about Terry. Like, he, he really just encouraged me to learn more about the technical side of photography. And if I, even now, even though I'm doing it as a degree, if I was to have a question about something particular, I could ask him, can, like, what does this bit do? Yeah. And he would help me because even though he doesn't really do photography much anymore, he is, he encourages me. He has the knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's my family. My family's always been very encouraging, and I love them. The fact that you already had a photographer in your family very much helped you get into photography. Terence being I, a photographer. I actually started photography before Terence because I did it as a GCSE. But you didn't have a camera. No, I didn't have a camera, but it was something that I was already like trying, and I already had like a little bit of experience with. Yeah. And then we pretty much got into it like around this exact same time. It's just he had a lot more capabilities because he was getting funding from college, and just a lot more capabilities like he had a lot more and he started studying it before you at college level so he had a bit more time to get to know what it all was and actually do it yeah yeah he was in a much more encouraging environment because he was doing it at a higher college like college and he was only doing photography when you were trying to do like your as levels which had nothing to do with photography so he had a bit of a a head start also my tutor at college started (laughs) It, yet another course that was trying to encourage us to think more about it artistically rather than teaching us how to do the thing. Yeah. Um, so then I go into being at uni. I've had a mixed experience with people at uni. Um, some teachers are too artsy for me. <laughs> and I also have a very particular opinion that photography teachers should do photography, especially at a uni level. <laughs> yeah. Um, if they're teaching photography at uni level, they should be <laughs> photographers. That's kind of the, the whole purpose, right? Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't teach physics if you wasn't a physicist. But my course falls under the fine art and photography course, so we can have some teachers who are more fine art oriented and are allowed to teach us technically. Mm, gross. <laughs> but yeah, I just want to give a shout out to some of my tutors. Uh, David Rule. He is the year leader for my third year. And he's so friendly and kind like he he encourages us in a different way to any of the tutors I have throughout this entire my entire uni degree because he the way he talks to us is very more is very much like we are professionals now. He yeah. to, he talks to us like no how are we going to improve your work at the like as a professional? How are we going to make your work into a gallery like setting? Yeah. He doesn't try and be like, no, this idea is stupid. You should try doing it this way. He acts like, like a uni student, uh, like like an actual uni teacher should. It's a case of, okay, you want to be someone who's on my level. I have this knowledge. Let me help you achieve your version of it. Right? Yeah. Like it's, yeah, it doesn't talk down to you. It's like, okay, let, how do we get this thing that you want? I've, I've done this thing before. So let's, let me, let me uh, show you what, what you can do. Exactly. 
and then there's also um, Tom. His name is Tom Bridge. Um, he is he's been my tutor for my final degree project, and he is another very warm person to talk to. Like you talk to him, and he doesn't. He just feels like you are having a conversation with him about your work rather than him telling you what to do. And he's like, oh, I like your idea here. Have you tried thinking of it in this saying? Have you tried doing this? And like, even, he's, a, he's the, one of the first tutors I've had that isn't afraid to show his own work to try and explain what he means, mm. but not in a way that feels braggy. <laughs> because some people tend to do that. Like, if they're showing you their own work, they're like, oh, look at my work. Look at how, look at how I did my work. And he's just like, no. <laughs> like, I was showing him some of my work the other day because I'm still doing my degree. <laughs> I was showing him some of my work the other day and he was like, oh, this reminded me of something that I did. And here's how I approached it. Would And, like, he gives you just, like, that kind of more personal advice. And it's not necessarily, here's how I did it, you should do it that way. It's, here's how I did it, can and, you take anything from that? Yeah, and also just, like, here's how I did it this is how I felt about it. Mm. Like, it's getting more into that more, yeah, like, emotional side of it. Anyway, as I've already said, I get a lot of inspiration from that that is in my immediate surroundings. So I'm going to give a shout out to a bunch of my friends. <laughs> because being around a group of creatives helps you think in a more creative way. Especially as they're all photographers for the most yeah. part. Yeah, so like my community that I've got at uni, they they are all photographers, but they all approach it in such a different way. Mm. So I just want to give a shout out to just a couple of my friends because I like how they work and how they have specifically inspired me. So Thea, Thea Sivy. <laughs> my, the first person I met at uni... She's actually been on this okay. podcast. <laughs> yeah, she has been on this podcast. Go check that out. That was in season one. We spoke about um, TV shows from our childhood. Yeah. Yeah, so she has a really creative way of interacting with an image. Like, she's not afraid to ruin an image in order to create a new... Like, take to print out a photograph and then just, like, cut it up. Sew into it. Burn it. She actually uh, treats the f photograph as a material object rather than... Just a file. Okay. At time. So I really like that. Catherine May. She, she may do what, what? <laughs> Get it? May. Anyway, yeah. Catherine. <laughs> um, she has done a couple of projects that really look at, like, sensitive topics. So her um, more recent project is looking at her sister and living with someone who has disabilities. And just families with disabilities. And one of her previous projects that she worked on was about living in a toxic relationship. And she does it in a way that makes it easier to approach the topic. Like as a viewer, you don't feel like very like overwhelmed by it. It's something that she opens up in a way that you're like, yeah, I can talk about this mm. in in a way, which is nice. Um John, John Sampson. Um I love the way that John works because he knows his equipment. Yeah. Anytime I've seen him doing anything, he knows what he is doing with his equipment. Even down to like, so he has like his cameras, he figures out how to use them like inside and out. And then his lighting, but also... He does a very similar style of photography to what you like doing as well with the yeah, low light gig yeah. photography. But also he has like he works a lot on Lightroom which is something I never really got to experiment with but the way that he uses it like he knows exactly what he's doing he makes presets to have a specific image style that he can then put throughout his work yeah and every piece that I see that comes from him I'm like this is John's work mm. I can see that it's John's style and I really like that and also um my our good friend Daniel, who has also been on this podcast before. And no doubt it will be again. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, he, a lot of the work I've seen from him, he recognises the history of photography. He is not afraid to acknowledge in his work what happened in just the photography community to get us to this point. A lot of his work seems very contextualised. There's a lot of surrounding information and... Yeah, I really like the way he does that because... Um, well, like one of the projects we had that we had that was um, shown in London 
it for his work it involved a lot of context and looking at old photographs and then changing the history of those photographs mm. I he, really he tends like to use like film cameras and stuff a lot more often than than a lot of your other friends as well yeah dan's someone that like if i am planning on working on film or working with old cameras he's usually around like the dark room as well if i've ever gone to a workshop where we're looking at old cameras dan's there mm. because it's it's fun and i like that dan incorporates that into his work yeah that's me talking about all the personal aspects of this <laughs> okay <laughs> um so i'm just going to go for a couple of just like other artists in the, like just out there in the world that have inspired me because you know they're all out there um one of the first ones is probably one of the biggest names i have here in photography and if you're not a photographer you've probably not heard of her <laughs> i don't know she's pretty big um this is annie Leibovitz. so she has worked with a lot of big celebrities she's taken quite a lot of influential portraits of these celebrities in their life like of these celebrities lives mm. so usually it's like you know you work with some people to get into some like fashion magazine like this is what some celebrities would do but pretty much you know you've hit it big if you are getting photo if you're getting photographed by Anna Leibovitz. Okay. Um she did one of some of the people I was looking at, it was like Michael Jordan. She's taken some like really cool photos of him. But um and one of the most recognized she's she took one of the most recognizable photos of John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd as the Blues Brothers. So when you think about what they look like, she took one of like that photo that they have with their faces painted blue. That she took that photo. Okay. Um, one of the specific art pieces of work that she did that really made me think, wow, I really like her work. She took a photo of Demi Moore for the cover of Vanity Fair while Demi Moore was pregnant. So it's like this iconic photo. It was in 1991 of Demi Moore naked and just like holding her pregnant belly. And it was the first time a woman has been portrayed in like they in this way on a cover of a fashion magazine like she wasn't wearing anything, anything. So there was like a sexualized pregnant woman and it hadn't been done before yeah like, okay. it was it was to show that you could be pregnant and sexy and this was at like the peak of Demi Moore's career yeah it was when she was really big so it was actually really influential at the time to show a naked pregnant woman looking stunning <laughs> So it was it was really I really like her work because she can work with anyone and find a way to portray their personality. So she doesn't have like a specific style because she just works with the person she's working with to get their best view. Mm. One person that I guess I could say inspires me out of spite. <laughs> <laughs> so you hate him but it's still inspirational. Yeah, this guy, I hate him. But he has inspired me to <laughs> to steer clear from him. But he is apparently he is just something, and that is Roland Barthes. Any photographer who has looked into photography theory knows who I'm talking about. <laughs> mm. I hate this guy. <laughs> he is the worst. <laughs> Anyone I've ever spoken to at uni who has done any of the theory knows how I feel about Roland Barthes. <laughs> He just has very odd views of photography and he's really pretentious. And when I was writing my dissertation, I went out of my way to not use it. Yeah. <laughs> like, he can be applied to anything. And I think that is something that is very stupid. He's like the Sigmund <laughs> Freud of photography. Because Sigmund Freud was a dickhead whose most theories were wrong, but a lot of them were unfalsifiable. So people just have to keep talking about him, even though... It's, it's just nonsense. That's exactly it. Yeah. <laughs> um, one person who... I, another person here I've got that is a was a big inspiration to me, especially as I was writing my dissertation, which was literally this month. That's why this episode's coming out so late. Um, John Herschel. Oh, I love John Herschel. He's a brilliant scientist. Yeah, so he was a polymath. Um, but specifically, his impact on photography was, one, coming up with the term photography. Two, coming up with a way to fix images so that they lasted. 
<laughs> so they weren't just, oh, here is an image. It's going to fade eventually. He found a way to get it to stay there. Yeah. That's and, kind of all of photography, really. Yeah, that's the significant part of it. He worked with um, Henry Fox Talbot, yeah. who is like the inventor of photography. Um, but also, John Herschel invented the cyanotype, which is also more commonly known as the blueprint. Yep, very important. <laughs> so I thought I'd just quickly, um, from <laughs> from Google, got like some of the things that he created yes yeah, he's a bit of a god <laughs> english polymath mathematician astronomer chemist inventor experimental photographer who invented the blueprint and did botanical work yeah he also originated the use of the julian day system in astronomy yeah he he, he had a big impact he's one of those old english like philosopher scientists who did like just everything who yeah. revolutionized a lot yeah um Another big name, actually, an actual photographer, now that I'm talking about him, a big name in photography, and that is Jo Spence. She is, like, she is one of the OG, like, feminists. She did so much for feminism when she was around. Like, she was incredible. Mm. Um, some cool things about her. She got a caravan and turned it into a travelling darkroom. <laughs> Cool. So she would go out and find communities. She worked a lot with like the gypsy traveler community. Yeah. And she went out and taught them photography and was taking photos of them. And that's what she would do. She would go out and teach people photography because she was like, why would I not? <laughs> that's kind of how she viewed it. She was like, I've, I like she photography. Was an, so she was an educator. Yeah, in a way. Like she, it's, she's never considered primarily as an educator, but she wanted to share the medium of photography with everyone. Yeah. Um, she also coined the term phototherapy, which is something that she used herself because when she was diagnosed with breast cancer, she expressed her feelings through photography, which I guess wasn't really something that was done. But she was like, no, this is the only thing I know. This is the only thing I do. Mm. So I'm going to work with it and find a way to make it express my feelings, which is just... Yeah. I really Same like as that. any art therapy. Really. Yeah. But she found a way to specifically do it with photography. Yeah. And she also didn't take herself too seriously in some of these. Like, she would dress up as other people and take photos of herself. Not in a kind of way of, like, Cindy Sherman. Cindy Sherman would is another photographer who would literally, like, put on makeup to look like a specific celebrity. Whereas Joe Spence would do it just to look like a different human being and then take photos of herself as if she was just, like... Just someone else, like, just put on a wig and... Just some random dress. person. Yeah. Yeah, like, just, no one specifically. Yeah, no one specifically, but just to become a different person to photograph. Yeah. And she also did one where she literally just poured sugar on her head and took photos of it, just because. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Jo Spence, she's a real big name in photography, so most photographers would know about her. Um, another cool photographer that I like um, is Stephen Gill. He was very experimental with his work and he, the way looking at his work taught me not to be too serious about photography and learn how to experiment more with it. And how he would experiment with his work is he would go out somewhere to take photos of something, but before he would take the photos, he would get a handful of dirt and put it in his camera. Why? <laughs> <laughs> It was, it's a very experimental, very artsy thing to do because it was taking a photo of like the dirt or this like stuff that he found on the ground of this particular area he was taking a photo of and then he would take a photo of the place. <laughs> just because. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was just... It made me... F in looking at his work makes me feel less rigid about taking photos. Because, because he was so over-the-top stupid that you can yeah. <laughs> do what you want. It makes you think it's an art. of a different way of photography. Like, yeah. Don't take it as much of like a, this strict, specific camera vibe that I get from photography. Like it, You don't have to have that very rigid feeling. There's not it. these strict rules because yeah. it, it's an art form, so you can... You can do what you want. You can do it badly and it's fine. Yeah, but he also, his work is very just like beautiful, like the way it's done, because if yeah. he would put like petals in there and like because they have like that translucency, it would translate into the, like into the photo. Yeah. Um, 
One photographer I found in the last couple years, I've been watching her as she grows and becomes more popular, and that is Ellie Mitchell. Is this the Rollo Tomasi's photographer? Yes. Yeah, she's really good. So, as mentioned in Sean's um, last episode about his inspirations, he spoke about Rollo Tomasi, a band that we both like. And on their Instagram, I saw these really cool photos, and I was like, who took these photos? And it was Ellie Mitchell. And then since then, I've been seeing her work just go so much further. She's doing so much more. She's working in the studio with musicians. Um, just, like, taking more, like, cover photos for them, like, album cover photos. Yeah. It's just lots of live photography with big bands on big tours as well. Yeah, right? she also... Um, she went to download, and she was actually hired to be press yeah. photos for download. It's mostly for metal bands, right? She's yeah, like a metal she, band Yeah, she, she specifically works with, like, metal bands because I guess that's what she likes. And it's so. a specific aesthetic to the, the photos. Yeah, like, her aesthetic really is, like... <laughs> the edgier yeah. side of things. Yeah, and it's just a specific one that she's made that can carry through all these different bands. Uh, bands, yeah. Yeah. Rosie Foster is someone I found over the last um, year. So she's someone I found on Instagram because that's primarily where I find most of my photographers now. Because these are new people and they all have very different. But, like, things going on, like, yeah. it's difficult to explain, but, like, you know, she's trying to put her work out there, and I, I like her work. So, yeah, Rosie Foster, um, she works primarily with women, and she takes photos of them in their own homes, and quite often, not wearing many clothes. Oh, that's an upside. <laughs> <laughs> um, so she shoots a lot of things on medium format, because medium format cameras, like, is, medium format is, like, a film type like it's um 120 millimeter and it holds a lot more data inside the film like yeah a lot more information in the film i say data it's not data um yeah so she works on that and she gets hired by like a couple magazines but sometimes she does just work on her own stuff where she just enjoys taking photos of women in a very natural form like these women look very comfortable just being like in their underwear or not wearing much and it's not sexualized it's done in a way that just makes it you just look at the body and you're like it's just nice. a natural form in yeah. their own home relaxed yeah and she also i believe i did see a series of this but i couldn't find it on her website um she took photos of mothers with their children but in a way that was like empowering them like taking photos of them in lingerie to mm. show that you can still be sexy and be a mother, because that's something that often gets lost. Well, you have to be sexy in order to become a mother. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you're right. <laughs> Another Instagram page that I found that really inspires me, it's not a person, it's just an Instagram page that's like a collection of yeah. work, which is called First of the Roll, which is when you're shooting on film, often the first photo will get caught in some kind of like emulsion problem where only half the photo will come out onto the film because say like the first bit's already been exposed or it doesn't have the emulsion on it yet but you can still take part of a photo okay so like it registers in your camera as a whole shot but it doesn't actually like take the whole photo that you're taking so it will like cut off half of it and leave this weird like emulsion chemical line halfway through <laughs> it's hard to explain, but you can find One it. One of the many issues of film cameras is <laughs> why DSLRs exist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there's something that's really beautiful about it because the way that it interrupts what could... Like, interrupts the photo of what it could be and you can see half of what it was meant to be. Okay. And that's the whole point in this Instagram account. It's just kind of seeing the beautifulness of... The beauty. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the beauty. The beautificality. <laughs> yes. The beauty of this disrupted image and like getting those chemical lines on them. Mm. Just seeing and also just like seeing the different subject matter that people are using. Like it could be anything. It could just be like a photo of your dog, but you can only see half of the dog. Or you can recognize, say, like a um God, I can't think of what the word is, like 
the Eiffel Tower or like like a monument monument yeah <laughs> that's the word or a landmark or something yeah like people taking photos of these like things that you can recognise but half of the photo has been cut off because it is <laughs> that's just what the way that film works yeah I really like that account because it's just seeing the way that things can be out of your control in these images yeah um and then finally someone I met over the last couple months and I really like her work. Met or discovered? Met. Um, oh, okay. We had a talk with her at uni, which was really nice because it's not that often we get to actually talk to photographers in the industry Yeah. at uni. Like, they try to, but as I said, it's a fine art course. We talk to a lot of people that are on the brink of photography. <laughs> Nonsensical fine artists <laughs> that are full of pretentiousness. Yeah. Like, I, I don't want to bash fine artists, but that's not what I'm doing. <laughs> but let's be real. <laughs> you're full of some nonsense. <laughs> So, she makes work using many different types of photographic practices. So, like, cyanotypes, shooting on different types of film. Um, just what, And she also has her own collective. I can't remember what the f- collective is called. Um, but she built her own collective of people who make like-minded photography... Like, photo- photography projects. Yeah. Um, but one thing that she did that particularly stuck out to me is she did a series called Lunar Portraits, which she would take photos of people like that she knew, or just just in general, like, she would taking portraits with the only light source being the moon. Yeah. Which I'm sure anyone would know, like, just walking out with just outside in the dark with only the moonlight, you can't see much. I don't know, it depends, <laughs> I guess it depends where you are and how big the moon is and stuff like that. Yeah. So you can probably get some really cool lighting if you're, if you're lucky. Yeah, but when you shoot, when using a, f- a camera, it's really difficult to get that sensitivity without getting a lot of noise, which is, like, noise is, like, it's like little bits that show up on your camera show up in your camera that really make it look fuzzy it's like when there's noisy. missing information so the camera's trying to just guess i would imagine yeah i guess it could be like seeing like that so it makes it look really noisy you can't really get a sharp focus but that's something that she worked on she was taking these portraits and it's i love low light photography like that is that is me i love low light photography yeah that's why i want to be a music photographer but to use just the moon as your light source, it's incredibly difficult. And I loved that entire series that she made because it's just so good. But she's also really interested in space and just space photography. Why would you not be? Astrophotography is incredible. It is. And that's something that... what your whole dissertation was about. Yeah, that's (laughs) something that really made me feel like I could bond with her because quite often if we have artists talk, I don't like to pipe up about things. I'm like, these are professionals. They don't want to be bothered with my stuff. But I feel comfortable enough to say, like, to tell her about my dissertation idea, which was talking about whether or not the black hole image that was taken in 2018 was a photograph. Yeah. Um, so I spoke to her about it and I was like, yeah, this is kind of like my dissertation thing. And it's nice to see someone who also looks at astrophotography. And she was like, personally, I'm going to say that it's not a photograph. <laughs> yeah, it's an image. <laughs> yeah, it's an image, but it's not a photograph. And this was one of the first people that I have found who would explicitly say to me, no, this is my opinion and I can agree with you. Or yeah. here, here is just an explicit opinion about this thing that I actually care a lot about. This is... I, I got deep into this in my dissertation. I wish I could have gone further. Maybe I'll write a book one day. (laughs) But it was nice having someone out there that was willing to talk to me about this. And she was like, this sounds interesting. It was nice having that kind of encouragement from someone that really inspired me to carry on writing my dissertation about what I wrote it about. Yeah. Because having someone out there who was like, no, this actually is genuinely interesting. Yeah. It's nice having that. But yeah, Melanie King, she's really cool. (laughs) (laughs) That's everyone. I say everyone. There's definitely more people who have inspired me, just people I couldn't particularly remember because (laughs) I've seen a lot. (laughs) I guess most of your inspiration doesn't necessarily come from other photographers. It just comes from just, you know, seeing bands live and being like, I want to capture this or... Yeah, just being at download really inspired me to take photos photos of bands because I was like this is incredible yeah (laughs) things like that like there are and also like I could watch a film and see a particular type of lighting and be like I want to do that 
Yeah. <laughs> it's all these kind of things. There are a lot of things that have inspired me, and it's so difficult to list them and to keep track of all of them. Yeah. Especially when things change so quickly. Yeah. <laughs> we could do an updated version of what inspires us in a, in a year or two's time, and it would be... It, it could be entirely it would, yeah, different. It could be completely different. We probably won't do that, though, because you've probably <laughs> had enough of here, of us talking about the things that inspire us. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's me. Yeah. Uh, thank you for listening. And I hope that you like this. You can find some people that would inspire you from this. And if you want to tell me some people, photographers, show me some photographs specifically that have inspired you, Show show them to me. I'm yeah. really interested. I I love to see new work. Yeah, just go to the the the, the at yet untitled. Oh god, I can't speak English. <laughs> the at yet untitled podcast. It's the as yet untitled. What am I at the as yet untitled podcast? There we go. What a just disaster. go there on Facebook or Instagram, and you can yeah, you can drop us a message or share us share us a post or something. Tag us in something. Yeah, we'd uh, we'd love to hear from you and see yeah. your stuffs on both. What stuff that inspires me or stuff that inspires Sean as you know you can find Sean's episode somewhere around where, where you found <laughs> this one yeah <laughs> and yeah thank you yeah this has follow, been great. subscribe all the usual garbage that the internet forces you to do and carry on listening to our wonderful podcast bless your ears with our our beautiful <laughs> ramblings about nonsense that probably doesn't matter yeah. <laughs> Goodbye. We'll catch you in the next episode. See you.